Where are Elmer, Herman, Burke, Tom, and Charlie? The weak of will, the strong of arm, the clown, the boozer, the fighter, all are sleeping on the hill. One passed in a fever. One was burned in a mine. One was killed in a brawl. One died in a jail. One fell from a bridge, toiling for children and wife. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Ella, Kate, Mag, Lizzie, and Edith? The tender heart, the simple soul, the loud, the proud, the happy one? All, all are sleeping on the hill. One died in shameful childbirth. One of a thwarted love. One at the hands of a brute in a brothel. One of a broken pride in search for her heart's desire. One after life in a faraway London and Paris. Was brought to her little space by Ella, Kate, and Mag. All, all are sleeping, sleeping, sleeping on the hill. Where are Uncle Isaac and Aunt Emily? And old Tony Kincaid and Sevening Houghton? And Major Walker, who had talked with vulnerable men of the revolution? All, all are sleeping on the hill. They brought them dead sons from the war and daughters whose life had crushed. And their children, fatherless, crying. All, all are sleeping on the hill. Where is old Fiddler Jones, who played with life all his 90 years, braving the sleet with bared breasts, drinking, riding, thinking neither of wife nor kin, nor gold, nor love, nor heaven? Lo, he bubbles of the fish fries of long ago, of the horse races of long ago at Clary's Grove, of what Abe Lincoln said one time at Springfield. to the end of the path. But two of the children thought he was right. And two of the children thought I was right. And the two that sided with him blamed me. And the two that sided with me blamed him. And they grieved for the one they sided with. And all were torn with the guilt of judging and tortured in soul because they could not admire equally him and me. Every gardener knows that plants grown in sores or under stones are twisted and yellow and weak. And no mother is going to let her baby suck diseased milk from her breast. Yet, preachers mm -hmm. and judges advise the raising of souls. Where there is no sunlight, only twilight. And no warmth, only dampness and, and cold. I would have been as great as George Eliot, but for an untoward fate. For look at a photograph of me made by Pennywit. Chin resting on hand and deep set eyes, gray to and far searching. But there was the old, old problem. Should it be celibacy, matrimony? or unchastity. 
Then John Slack, the rich druggist, wooed me, luring me with the promise of leisure for my novel. And I married him, giving birth to eight children and had no time to write. It was all over with me anyway when I ran the needle through my hand while washing the baby's things and died from lockjaw, an ironical death. Hear me, ambitious souls. Sex is the curse of life. To this generation, I would say, memorize a bit of verse, truth, or beauty. It may serve a turn in your life. My husband had nothing to do with the fall of the bank. He was the only cashier. The wreck was due to the president, Thomas Rhodes, and his vain, unscrupulous son. Yet my husband was sent to prison, and I was left with the children to, to feed and clothe and school them. And I did it, and sent them forth into the world all clean and strong and all with the wisdom of Pope, the poet. Act well your part. There all the honor lies. I am Minerva, the village poetess, hooted at, jeered at by the yahoos of the street. For my heavy body, cock eye, and rolling walk, and all the more when Butch Weldy captured me after a brutal hunt. He left me to my fate with Dr. Myers, and I sank into death, growing numb from the feet up, like one stepping deeper and deeper into a stream of ice. Will someone go to the village newspaper and gather into a book the verses I wrote? I thirsted so for love, I hungered so for life. I ran away from home with the circus, having fallen in love with Mademoiselle and Shawada, the lion tamer. One time, I mean, after having starved the lions for more than a day, I began to be Brutus and Leo and Gypsy. Whereupon Brutus sprang upon me and killed me. Entering these regions, I'm in a shadow who cursed me. I said, It was Robespierre. How many times during the 20 years I was your leader, friends of Spoon River, did you neglect the convention and the caucus? and leave on my hands the burden of guarding and saving the people's cause. Sometimes because you were ill, or your grandmother was ill, or you drank too much and you fell asleep, or else you said, he is our leader, all will be well, he'll fight for us. We have nothing to do but follow. But oh, how you cursed me, and cursed me, when I left the caucus room for a moment, when the people's enemies there assembled, waited and watched for a chance to destroy the sacred rights of the people. You calm and rabble, I left the caucus to go to the urinal. Maurice. Weep not. I am not here under this pine tree. Oh, the, the balmy spring air whispers through the green grass. The stars sparkle. The whippoorwill calls. But thou grievest. 
while my soul lies rapturous in the blessed nirvana of eternal light. Go to the good heart that is my husband, for he broods about our guilty love. Tell him my love for you is no less than my love for him wrought out my destiny. Through flesh, I want spirit, and through spirit, peace. There is no marriage in heaven, but there is love. Harry Carey Goodhue. Now you remember that name. Now you never marvel, dullards of Spoon River, when Chase Henry voted against the saloons to revenge himself for being shut off. But none of you was keen enough to follow my steps or trace me home as Chase's spiritual brother. Do you remember when I fought the bank in the courthouse ring for pocketing the interest on public funds, huh? Or, or when I fought the leading citizens for making the poor the pack horses of the taxes, huh? Remember that? And when I fought the waterworks for stealing streets and raising rates, that was me. And when I fought the businessmen, who fought me on these fights. That's right. Then, do you remember that staggering upfront wreck of defeat and the wreck of a ruined career? I slipped from my cloak, my last ideal, hidden from all eyes until then, like a cherished jawbone of an ass, and smoked the bank and the waterworks and the businessmen with prohibition and made Spoon River pay the cost of the fights that I had lost. Have you seen a man walking through the village with downcast eyes and haggard face? That is my husband, who by secret cruelty, never to be told, robbed me of my youth and my beauty to at last wrinkled and yellow teeth and with broken pride and shameful humility, I, I sank into the grave. But what think you gnaws at my husband's heart? The face of what I was or the face of what he made me? These are the things that are drawing him to the place <laughs> where I lie in death. <laughs> Therefore I, I am a man. <laughs> back and forth, back and forth, to and from the church with my Bible under my arm until I was gray and old unwedded and alone in the world, finding brothers and sisters in the congregation and children in the church. I know they laughed and thought me queer. I knew with the eagle souls that flew high in the sunlight above the spire of the church, laughed at the church disdaining me, not seeing me. But if the high air was sweet to them, sweet was the church to me. It was the vision, vision, vision of poets democratized. Only the chemist can tell, and not always the chemist, what will result from compounding fluids or solids. And who can tell how men and women will interact on each other, or what children will result. There was Benjamin Pantier and his wife, good in themselves, but evil towards each other. He oxygen, she hydrogen, their son a devastating fire. I, trainer the druggist, a miser of chemicals, killed while making an experiment, lived unwedded. Ask me, have all you to say against the sentence only shaking my head. What could I say to the Scion, 
before the jury, returning no words to the judge when he asked me, have all you to say against the sentence? Only shaking my head. What could I say to the people who found a 35-year-old woman at fault when her lover of 90 killed her husband? And she had said over and over, go away, Elmer. Go far away. I have maddened your brain with the gift of my body. You will do some terrible thing. And just as I feared, he killed my husband, with which I have nothing to do. Before God, silent, for 30 years in prison, and the iron gates of Juliet swung as the gray and silent trustees carried me out in a coffin. How does it happen? Tell me that I, who was the most erudite of lawyers, who, who knew Blackstone and Cole almost by heart, who gave the greatest speech the, the courthouse ever heard, and wrote a brief that won the praise of Justice Breeze. How does it happen? Tell me that I lie here, unmarked and forgotten, while Chase Henry, the town drunkard, has a marble block, topped with an urn, where in nature and a mood ironical has a sword of flowering weed. Tell me. We quarreled that morning, for he was 65 and I was 30. And I was just so nervous and heavy with child whose birth I dreaded. And then I looked over the last letter written me by that strange young soul whose betrayal I had concealed by marrying the old man. Then I took morphine and sat down to read. Across the blackness that overcame my eyes, I still see the flickering lights of those words even now. And Jesus said, unto him, verily I see unto thee, today shalt be with me in paradise. I was a peasant girl from Germany, blue-eyed, rosy-cheeked, happy, and strong. The first place I worked was at Thomas Green's. On a summer's day, while she was away, he stole into the kitchen and took me up into his arms. He kissed me on my throat. I turning my head. And then neither of us seemed to know what happened. And I cried for what would become of me. And I cried and I cried when my secret began to show. One day Mrs. Green said she understood and would make no trouble for me. And being childless, she would adopt it. He had given her a farm to be still. So she hid in the house and sent out rumors as if it was going to happen to her. And all went well. And the child was born. They were so kind to me. Later, I married Gus Bertman, and years passed. But at political rallies, when sitters by thought I was crying at the eloquence of Hamilton Green, no, that was not it. 
I wanted to say, that's my son. That's my son. Uh, Mr. Kessler, you know, was in the army. He collected and had six dollars a month, every month as a pension. He stood on the corner talking politics or sat at home reading Grant's memoirs. I support the family by washing, learning all the secrets of the people through their counterpanes, window panes, shirts and skirts. Things that are new grow old over time. They're replaced by something better or none at all. Some people are prospering, others are falling back. Rents and patches widen with time. And there is no needle or thread that can pace decay. There are stains that bath the soap, and there are colors that run that despite you, even though you are blamed for spoiling a dress. Handkerchiefs and napery hold secrets, but the laundress, life, knows all about it. And I, who attended all the funerals held in Spoon River, swear I never saw a dead face without thinking it looked like something washed and ironed. Where is my boy? My boy in what far part of the world? The boy I loved best of all in the school. I, the teacher, the old maid, the virgin heart who made them all my children. Did I know my boy right, thinking of him as a spirit of flame, active, ever aspiring? A boy, boy for whom I prayed and prayed many a watchful hour at night. Do you remember the letter I wrote to you of the beautiful love of Christ? And whether you ever took it or not, my boy, wherever you are, work for your soul's sake. That all the clay of you, all the dross of you, may yield to the fire of you till that fire is nothing but light, nothing but light. I was the first fruits to battle the Missionary Ridge. With a bullet into my heart, I wish I had stayed home, or gone to jail, for stealing the hogs of Crow Trenary instead of running away and joining the army. Rather a thousand times a county jail than to lie under this marble figure with wings and this granite pedestal bearing the words Propatria. What does that mean, anyway? I was only eight years old. And before I even knew grew up and knew what it meant. I had no words for it, except that I was frightened. And I told my mother, and that my father got a pistol, and he would have killed Charlie, who was a big boy, 15 years old, except for his mother. Nevertheless, the story clung to me but the man who married me, a widower of 35, did not hear of it until two years after we were married. And then he felt himself cheated. And the village agreed that I was not really a virgin. Well, he deserted me and I died the following winter. This earth keeps some vibration going there in your heart. And that is you. And if the world find out you can fiddle, why fiddle you must for all your life? What do you see? A harvest in the clover, 
or of metals to walk through to the river. You close your eyes, the winds and the corn, you rub your hands for the beats you're after, ready for the aftermarket. Or, you hear the rustle of the skirts, like the girls when they dance a little grove. Cooney Potter's pillar of dust and whirling leaves, it usually meant a ruinous drought. They looked at me like the red-handed Sammy, stepping it off to tour lore. How can an Ansel 40 acres and not speak of wanting more? With the melody of the horns, bassoons, piccolos, stirred in my brain with the crows and robins, the only creak in the window. <laughs> only these? I never started to plan my life without someone stopping me in the middle of the road to take me to a dance or picnic. I got my 40 acres. I ended up with a broken fiddle. I ended up with a broken laugh. And a thousand memories, and not one single regret. I belong to the church. I also belong to the party of prohibition. The villagers thought I died of eating watermelon. In truth, I had cirrhosis of the liver. For every noon for 30 years, I slipped past the prescription partition at Trainer's Drugstore and poured a generous drink from a bottle labeled Spiritus Frumenti. I know that he told that I snared his soul with a snare which bled him to death. And all the men loved him, and most of the women pitied him. But suppose you are really a lady with delicate tastes, and loathe the smell of whiskey and onions, and the rhythm of Wordsworth's ode runs in your ears, while he goes about from morning till night repeating bits of that common thing. Oh, why should the spirit of mortal be proud? And then suppose you are a woman well endowed, and the only man with whom the law and morality permit you to have the marital relation is the very man that fills you with disgust every time you think of it, while you think of it, every time you see him. That's why I drove him away from home to live with his dog in a dingy office room. They have chiseled on my stone these words. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, This was a man. Those who knew me smile when they read this empty rhetoric. My epitaph should have been, His life was not gentle. And the elements so mixed in him that he declared warfare on life, the wherein he was slain. While I lived, I could not cope with slanderous tongues. Now that I am dead, I must submit to an epitaph graven by a fool. My name used to be in the papers daily. 
for having dined somewhere or traveled somewhere or rented a house in Paris where I entertain the nobility. I was always eating, traveling, or taking the cure at Baden-Baden. And now I am here to do honor to Spoon River. Hmm. Yeah, beside my family from whence I sprang. Now no one cares where I dined, or lived, or whom I entertained, or how often I took the cure at Biden Biden. Henry got me with child, knowing that I could lose my womb by bringing forth life. In my youth, therefore, I traveled into the into the uh, dust, where travelers believed that I that my husband loved me with the husband loved, but I proclaimed from the dust that he slew me um, with, to gratify his hatred. I went to the dances at Channelville. I played snap out in Winchester. One time we changed partners, driving home in the moonlight in middle June. And then I met Davis. We were married and lived together for 70 years, enjoying, working, raising the 12 children, eight of whom we lost ere I reached the age of 60. I spun, I wove, I kept the house, I nursed the sick, I made the garden, and for holiday rambled over the fields where sang the larks. And by Spoon River I gathered many a shell and many a flower and medicinal weeds, shouting to the wooded hills and singing to the green valleys. At 96, I had lived enough, that is all and pass to a sweet repose. What is this I hear of sorrow and weariness, anger, discontent, and drooping hopes? Degenerate sons and daughters, life is too strong for you. It takes life to love life. as great as Edison, or greater. For as a boy, I made balloons, and wondrous kites, and toys with clocks, and little engines with tracks to run on, and telephones of cans and thread. I played the coronet, and painted pictures, modeled in clay, <laughs> and took the part of the villain in the octoroon. But then at 21, I married, and had to live. And so, to live, I learned the trade of making watches and kept the jewelry store on the square. Thinking. Thinking? Thinking. Thinking not of business, but of the engine I studied the calculus to build 
And all Spoon River watched and waited to see it work. But it never worked. And a few kind souls believed my genius was somehow hampered by the store. It wasn't true. The truth was this. I did not have the brains. Passerby, to love is to find your own soul. Through the soul of the beloved one. When the beloved one withdraw itself from your soul, you have lost your soul. It is written, I have a friend, but my sorrow has no friend. Hence the long years of solitude at the home of my father, trying to get myself back and to turn my sorrows into a supremer self. But there is my father with his sorrows, sitting under a cedar tree, a picture that sank into my heart at last, bringing infinite remorse. Oh, ye souls who have made life fragrant and white as tubed roses from earth's dark soil, eternal peace. Pine woods on the hill and the farmhouse miles away showed clear as though behind a lens under a sky of peacock blue. Just a blanket of cloud by afternoon muffled the earth. And you walked the road and the clover field where the only sound was a cricket's liquid tremolo. And the sun went down between the great drifts of distant storms. For a rising wind swept clean the sky and blew the flames of the unprotected stars and swayed the russet wound hanging between the rim of the hill and the twinkling boughs of the apple orchards. You walked the shore in thought where the threats of the waves were like whippoorwills singing beneath the water and crying to the wash of the wind in the cedar trees till you stood too full of tears by the cot and looking up saw Jupiter tipping the spire of the giant pine and looking down I saw the vacant chair rocked by the wind on the lonely porch. Be brave, beloved. Dust of my dust, and dust with my dust. O oh, child who died as you entered the world, dead with my death. Not knowing breath, though you tried so hard, with a heart that beat when you lived with me, and stopped when you left me for life. It is well, my child, for you never had to travel the long, long road that begins with school days, when little fingers blur under the tears that fall on the crooked letters, and the earliest wound, when a little mate leaves you alone for another, and sickness, and the face of fear by the bed, the death of a father or mother, or shame for them, or poverty, the maiden sorrow of school days ended, and eyeless nature that makes you drink from the cup of love though you know it's poisoned, to whom would your flower face have been lifted? Botanist, weakling? Cry of what blood to yours, pure or foul, that makes no difference. It's blood that calls to our blood. And then your children. What my baby? And what your sorrow? Child. Child death is better than life.
From Bindle's Opera House in the Village to Broadway is a great step, but I tried to take it. My ambition fired when I was 16 years of age, seeing East Lynn played here in the village by Ralph Barrett, coming romantic actor who enthralled my soul. True, I trailed back home, a broken failure, when Ralph disappeared in New York, leaving me all alone in the city. But life broke him also. In all this place of silence, there are no kindred spirits. How I wish that Dusa could stand amid the pathos of these quiet fields and read these words. She drained my strength by minutes. She, she took my life by hours. She drained me like, like a fever moon that saps the spinning world. My days went by like shadows. And the minutes breathed like stars. She took the pity from my heart and made it into, into smiles. She, she was a hunk of potter's clay, and my secret thoughts were, were fingers. They flew behind her pensive brow and, and lined it deep with, with pain. My soul entered into the clay, fighting like, like seven devils. It wasn't mine, it wasn't hers. She held it. It still struggles. It murdered a face she hated. A face I fear to see. I beat the windows and then shook the birds. I, I hid me in a corner. And then she died. It haunted me. It haunted me. It haunted me for life. It was moonlight. And the earth sparkled with new fallen frost. It was midnight and not a soul abroad. Out of the chimney of the courthouse, a greyhound of smoke leapt and chased the northwest wind. I carried a ladder to the landing of the stairs and leaned it against the frame of the trap door in the ceiling of the portico. And I crawled under the roof and amid the rafters and flung among the seasoned timbers a lighted handful of oil-soaked waste. And then I came down and slumped away. In a little while, the fire bell rang. Clang! 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 And the Spoon River laughed when he came with a dozen buckets. I began to pour water on the glorious bonfire, growing hotter, higher, and brighter, until the walls fell in and the limestone columns where Lincoln stood cracked like trees when the woodman fells them. When I came back from Joliet, there was a new courthouse with a dome, for I was punished. Like all who destroy the past for sake of the future.
I can take a trip back to a place in time. Everybody got a dream, so I'm chasing mine. Everybody got demons and I'm facing mine. But the clock's running out like I'm racing time. <laughs> so I gotta pack my bags and go to Hollywood. Cause they sold me a dream like I probably could. Leave SD behind, how I probably should. Trying to get some bag of money, yeah, I probably would. <laughs> 